仲直りできるかなやってごらんワイルドアームズ学校じゃ教えてくれないこといっぱい RPG ワイルドアームズ12月20日発売ワイルドアームズやったプレイステーション When it comes to common settings in JRPGs, there's probably a few that instantly come to mind. Of course, there's Medieval Fantasy, by far and away the most popular, but there's also some other pretty common settings like Steampunk Fantasy, really popularized during the PS1 era, and modern Japanese cities found in games like Persona. Yeah, there are some others, like sci fi and ancient Asia, however, these aren't nearly as common. What's even less common than those, though, is the Wild West setting. Before the PS1 generation, you really only had that one live a life scenario, and that was pretty much it. However, when the PlayStation came out, this would all change. And that change, my friends, was the Wild Arms series. As is obvious by the title of the video, we're only going to focus on the first entry here, but before we get into that, let's quickly go over a brief history of the series. The Wild Arms series was created by the company Media Vision and spans across five mainline entries, a tactical RPG spin off, and a remake of the first game for the PS2. It was also popular enough to get an anime and manga based on the franchise, known as Twilight Venom and Flower Thieves, respectively. The last official entry in the series was Wild Arms 5 for the PS2, however, there is a spiritual successor called Armed Fantasia to the End of the Wilderness, set to be released in March 2025. Yeah, I know that's not for a while, but it's never too early to start getting hyped. You got multiple Wild Arms veterans working on it, so the potential is definitely there. All in due time for that one, but for now, back to Media Vision and Wild Arms. Before they began development on the first game in the series, they only had two other titles under their belt. The first one was a launch title for the PS1 called Crime Crackers. A charming first person shooter with some role playing elements. Then there was Rapid Reload in Europe. or Gunner's Heaven as it was known in Japan, a 2D run-and-gun shooter for the PS1. Sadly, it did not get an American release, but the character art did seem to have some influence on the first Wild Arms game. The main character almost looks like a prototype for what would eventually be the cool-ass dude, Rudy Roughknight. I'm just gonna say it, Rudy probably has one of the coolest protagonist designs in my opinion. His original PS1 design, that is. His Ultra Code F design is a lot rounder and softer, and to me, it doesn't look nearly as good. Give me that jagged, sharp line style of 90s anime all day. And back to Media Vision, while they didn't have any prior RPG experience, that didn't stop them from wanting to throw their hat into the ring. RPGs seem to be pretty decent sellers at this point, so why not? And plus, there was a lot of hype around the release of the upcoming Final Fantasy VII, so they might have been trying to get a piece of that pie. Regardless if that was their intention or not, it did seem to work. Wild Arms was released for the PS1 on December 20th, 1996 in Japan, one month before Final Fantasy VII, and April 30th, 1997 in North America, five months before the release of Final Fantasy VII. It didn't come out in Europe until 1998 though, way after Final Fantasy VII was released. To all you homies across the sea, sorry for your misfortune. In Japan and North America though, the release date ended up being pivotal in some of its success. People wanted RPGs and, at the time, there wasn't a lot of selection on the PS1 yet know how that would change later on. With Final Fantasy VII right around the corner, gamers wanted to satisfy that role-playing itch in the meantime. Because of this, interest in Wild Arms was quite high and it sold well upon release. Over a quarter of a million copies in its first two weeks in Japan, in fact. It didn't just sell well either, it was also received very well, and pretty much eights and nines across the board, which is definitely respectable. Critics praise all the puzzle solving with the tool system and the visuals and music. Yeah, they even praise the 3D battle graphics at the time, which were quote unquote, cutting edge. The funny is that's probably the aspect about the game that's aged the most. The non-battle graphics look gorgeous though, and are 2D perfection. It more resembles a Super Nintendo RPG when it comes to presentation and has a timeless style. Visually, it's aged a lot better than some of its peers because of this. When it comes to the overall game though, can the same thing be said? Well my friends, and that's exactly what I aim to find out in this video. Just how well does the game hold up over 25 years after its initial release? Before we get into the main part though, I want to quickly go over my relationship with the game so you guys know what perspective I'm coming from. 
Given I wasn't even 5 years old when Wild Arms came out, needless to say, I did not play it upon release. My first foray into the series was through Wild Arms 2, about 5 years later. I got it for Christmas one year along with a couple other RPGs and absolutely loved it. I had only played a few RPGs at this point, such as Pokemon Blue, Super Mario RPG, and Legend of Lagaya. Not only was I instantly enamored by Wild Arms 2's unique Wild Western fantasy setting and cool character design, but its simplicity and easy to follow structure just made it easy for my 10 year old self to, well, follow along. You see, for that Christmas I also got Chrono Cross and while that one would grow to be one of my favorites over the years, back then, I was confused as hell and had no idea what was going on. Wild Arms 2 though, love at first sight. I loved it so much that I just had to see what the first game was all about. So, I logged into our old Vio desktop and hit up the game FAQ's message boards. After some brief looking around, I knew what needed to be done. The next time I was allowed to get a game, we went to our local mall, which is now sadly closed, and hit up the good old Game Co. I walk in, go to the PS1 section, and there it is. Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia on the wall, staring right at me. And say no more fam, with the case art that badass, how could I resist? Given the game was like 5 years old at this point, it was obviously used, so the employee asked me if I wanted to test it out first. Welcome to Funko Land. We specialize in selling previously played video games. We also carry a limited selection of new ones. I say yes, and out comes the glorious CRT TV from behind the counter. Before I know it, I have Rudy's chapter booted up and I'm running around Surf Village dropping bombs and shit. It was a magical moment. It goes without saying, we got the game, and the rest was history. I played the ever-loving shit out of it and formed a strong attachment to the series given that the first two games were some of my first RPGs ever. Because of this, Wild Arms might just be the JRPG series I have the most nostalgia for. Whenever I see the term Heal Barrier Gel, I'm just taken back to my childhood. With that said, even though I played and restarted Wild Arms a lot as a kid, I never actually beat it. Now, I did go back and beat it in college, but even that was like 10 years ago now. I'm old. I do remember really enjoying finally seeing it all the way through though and having it tied as my second favorite in the series with Wild Arms 3. So yeah, I'm very eager to replay it again and see how my opinions may have shifted. Like all of our other retrospectives, major spoilers will be marked with timestamps later in the video. However, anything up until about the halfway point, I consider fair game. To fully immerse you in the mindset of someone experiencing Wild Arms, it is of utmost importance that we watch the anime opening together. It was animated by Madhouse, a very prolific animation studio behind many works such as Ninja Scroll, Trigun, Vampire Hunter D, the first season of One Punch Man, the Hunter x Hunter remake, and many more. Between the animation and amazing music, it is an absolute spectacle and deserves to be watched in full. One of the GOAT intros in the entire genre, hands down. Alright, so I'm adding this part in afterwards, but unfortunately, the intro got copyright claimed, so we had to remove it. Why? 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 Yeah, it sucks, I know. When the main part of the video starts up, my first few lines aren't really gonna make sense now as they're addressing the opening, so sorry about that. If you haven't seen it though, I recommend watching it on YouTube. It's worth it. Now, extremely lengthy intro aside, let's finally dive into the meat of the video. This, my friends, is a retrospective over Wild Arms. What an immaculate atmosphere. Those whistles are iconic. It sets the vibe for the game perfectly. The way it leads into the title screen music too, ah, so good. Anyway, we're now at a character select screen where we can choose one of three characters to begin the game. Rudy, the wandering youth, Jack, the treasure hunter, and Cecilia, the girl from an abbey. Yeah, I kind of feel like she got the short end of the stick on that description there, but it's all good. Right off the bat, I really love this design choice. It doesn't matter what order you pick, as you're going to have to play as all of them eventually, but the concept behind it, allowing you to learn a little bit about the character's story before they meet up, as well as how they work from a gameplay standpoint, is very nice. 
Now, I'm choosing Rudy first, as is tradition for me, but he's debatedly not really the main protagonist, despite the game making it seem that way. I mean, he is, but Jack and Cecilia equally are as well, and perhaps even more so. More on that later. We get some exposition about how the land of Philgaia is gradually decaying and losing life, and is also filled with ferocious monsters. Those who venture out into the wilderness are called dream chasers, and I love that little line about it, how it being hard to believe that Rudy has the potential to become one, when it's like dream chasers are basically just homeless people that are too bored to stick around in the same place for too long. I mean, to be fair, I guess you do have to be pretty strong to venture out and kill monsters and shit, but just the way it's worded makes me laugh. I do love the Dream Chaser name though, it just has so much wonder and mystery to it, it's pretty cool. Anyway, it turns out that Rudy was hired by the mayor to help out around the village. We finish up a day's work and then are told we can see the mayor if we want some more. Before that though, let's wander around a bit first. This kid tells us about a monster sealed in a nearby cave, but that it's actually a fairy tale and that no one believes it. Yeah, sure thing, bucko, I've seen how this plays out before. In JRPGs, anytime someone tells you about a fairy tale or an old legend that no one believes anymore, it is without a doubt 100% real. This other kid over here tells us about this badass chick named Calamity Jane. Just another unwritten rule of JRPGs, if someone has ever name dropped that you haven't met yet, you will meet them at some point. I walk into this house and talk to Tony's mom who thanks us for our help since her husband is injured. Oh yeah, Tony's this kid from earlier who was scheming something but wouldn't tell us what it is. I talk to the dad laying down in bed who also thanks us for helping out when he's sick and it's like, wait, are you sick or injured? He also mentions that same cave with holy berries that that one kid also talked about, so yeah, it's pretty much confirmed we're going there soon enough. This guy over here asks us if we're a dream chaser and then tells us how he would love to live a life of adventure if he wasn't married. Damn, shots fired. Married people everywhere out clenching their fists or punching the air right now. About to type up a comment about how their trip to the grocery store to get chicken on sale was an adventure. And speaking of chickens, you can pick them up and throw them around. Some of them even drop items. Very cool. They won't gang up to attack you like in Zelda either, so you're safe from any potential mutinies. You can pick up and throw boxes as well for even more items. Early on, this already encourages you to explore your environments. Good game design. Alright, enough messing around for now, let's go see what the mayor has to say. As a thank you for our help, he gives us magical bombs that never run out. Keep this in mind for when this guy has the audacity to complain about violence later. Anyway, this is the first of four tools that Rudy gets in the game. Tools are basically just field commands that each character can use that lets them navigate through dungeons and solve puzzles. This is a big factor on why exploration in Wild Arms is so fun and satisfying. We'll talk some more about this later. The guy then rushes in and tells the mayor that a child from the village got lost in that same cave that everyone was talking about earlier. It's full of monsters, and they don't know what to do. Well, you know what time it is. It's Rudy rough night in time. Now, even though you can go directly to Barry Cave, you can actually wander around the world map a bit first. Are you supposed to go to Adelheid right now to buy gear and upgrade your arm? No, but you can. This freedom is nice and something often missing in newer JRPGs. Alright, let's actually go to Barry Cave now. Pretty straightforward dungeon, really. We got shit to blow up, treasure chests to open, and boxes to smash. We eventually reach a save point, and yeah, we know what's coming next. But first, look who it is. It's Tony. He said he ventured into the cave to try to get a holy berry and heal his dad. The little scoundrel may have caused a ruckus, but his heart's in the right place. <laughs> little scam. They say the damnedest thing, man. We grab the holy berry, and then something bad happens. An earthquake occurs across the land and ends up waking up that sealed monster in the cave. The way it creeps out from the back is a pretty cool shot. You basically just spam your regular attack and hand cannon and heal when needed to win. Very simple, but it is the first boss after all. Now, the battle may have been won, but unfortunately the war was lost as we have to use the Holy Berry to defeat the monster, kinda rendering this whole thing useless. We did save the kid though, so people should be thankful for that at least, right? Well, not really, as everyone's pissed at us for using the forbidden power of arms, aka ancient relic machines that we'll learn more about later. We're essentially blamed for everything, and everyone thinks we've cursed and brought doom upon the village. 
Even though I don't want to, I agree to be judged by the village's laws. As you can probably guess, everyone thinks we're too dangerous, so we're casted away, never to ride the sides of Sir Village ever again. The whole village is super judgmental, including the mayor who, need I remind you, played a role in setting this whole thing into motion. Dude, you literally gave me bombs and told me where to use them at. What the hell is wrong with you? Unfortunately, bombs don't hurt this hypocritical asshole, and the only thing that remains hurt are my feelings. I thought you guys were my friends. Alright, screw this village, you guys suck. Pretty sure you can come here late in the game after protecting the world numerous times and everyone still judges you. Hey, at least Tony appreciates and thanks us though. Nothing like the innocence of a child to see the good in people. We leave the village and thus ends Rudy's chapter. And that also reminds me, I can't believe that I forgot to mention up until now that Rudy is a silent protagonist. Honestly, I'm not really crazy about this trope and in this case, I'm not really sure if it works for me. I'll talk more about this later. For now, let's start up the chapter of Jack Van Buris. His chapter begins with him and his little windmouse companion checking out the Temple of Memory. In order to gain access, you're prompted to enter in your name, and I like how the game uses methods like this to name your characters, instead of, you know, just asking you before the chapter begins or something. Rudy's chapter also does this with them asking the new guy's name, as well as Cecilia's chapter with her needing to bind her name to a contract. It's a very minor detail, but just working this mechanic into the narrative is a good and immersive touch. Even though that may be your name, it's not the name the temple was looking for, which sets off a trapdoor. We then get a cool Indiana Jones running from a boulder segment while getting a little bit of background info on just who this pair is. Instantly, they make Jack sound like a badass. Master of the fast draw, dream chaser, the treasure hunter. They might as well have just said this is the coolest dude you'll ever meet. Of course, he's accompanied by Handpan, his curious and knowledgeable and slightly arrogant wind mouse companion. Okay, this concept is awesome. If not their own spin-off, can we please get like a video game or an anime or something about a treasure hunter and a snarky little animal companion going on adventures together? Now that sounds like a hit in the making if you ask me. The exposition also mentions something about Jack seeking the ultimate power. It's pretty vague as to what that is right now and kinda sounds silly, but it ends up being a lot deeper than it initially appears on the surface. The whole concept though kinda reminds me of Leroy from The Last Dragon seeking the glow. Yeah, I'm sure no one was expecting a Last Dragon reference in a Wild Armors retrospective. As far as the dungeon goes, it's another simple one. There are some notes from previous treasure hunters saying that everything's been picked over, but luckily, we have a wind mouse that can access some chests that they could not. Hand Pan acts as Jack's first tool and can open chests and flip switches from a distance. Perfect for gaps, traps, and stuff like that. Speaking of traps, since Jack has the shortest prologue, this is a good time to talk about how running works in Wild Arms. As you may have noticed, movement is a little bit different in this game. There's basic walking, of course, but then there's sprinting. When sprinting, you cannot turn, and you slide for a little bit at the end. This will seem very jarring at first, and for some people, maybe they'll never come around to it, but for me, I've grown to actually kind of like it. When you get the hang of it to string together a bunch of perfectly timed sprints to turn corners and enter in doors, it's super satisfying. Anyway, bring this up now, because in order to pass some traps, Jack needs to be nimble, and he needs to be quick. At the end of the dungeon, through the help of Hand Pan hitting a switch, we get teleported to a different room. In this room, there's a hologram of a... shit. L... What? Yeah, one of the most awkward looking names ever. I have no idea how they expected people to pronounce this. As a kid, I always said Yule, but the W's in the wrong place for that, so... Yeah, I don't know, it's confusing as hell. Apparently, the Wild Arms wiki says it's pronounced as Alu, so let's just go with that, I guess. Anyway, Alu were alien species that once lived on Felgaia that have magic technology. The Alu hologram speaks into Jack's mind and warns him to not seek out the destructive power of Lolithia. I like how he warns us like five times not to seek it out, but then he tells us where it's at anyway. It's like, don't look for it. Seriously, better not look for it. I mean, if you want to look for it, here's where you can find it, but for real, do not look for it though. He tells us it can be found in the Land of Light, to which Handpan says Light is often translated to Adelheid, so guess where we're going next. Since Jack is after the absolute power, off to Adelheid we go. The chapter then ends with some text about what power really means and stuff about the past and the future. Yeah, no boss for the Jackman, I guess. Kind of an odd design choice, but no oh well. Let's start up the final prologue that is Cecilia's. Her chapter begins with a mysterious voice calling out to her, asking for her name to bind to an ancient contract like I previously mentioned. We get some vague speak about being the innocent one, the world being engulfed in darkness, and how some power is in the book, I guess. The mysterious voice calling out our name then transitions to our classmates calling out our name as we awaken in class. 
We find out that Cecilia is a princess of Adelheid who was to return to Adelheid on her 17th birthday, which conveniently happens to be today. We're supposed to say goodbye to everyone first, so let's do that. A lot of people you talk to either give you some background info or tell you a little bit about how magic works. The place where we're at is called Kieran Abbey, basically just a magic academy. Honestly, I love the whole magic school trope. It reminds me of Vane in Lunar Silver Star Story. I always love that place. Anyway, we come across this dude who dropped a bunch of books and needs our help. Why this is our problem, I have no idea. He wants us to get a pocket watch from the magician Angie, which will supposedly reverse time and put all the books back up on the shelves. Dude, there's literally 11 books. It'll take you maybe a minute to do it yourself. The bookshelf next to us has pretty important lore about the history of Philgaia. A thousand years ago, a race of metal demons invaded Philgaia, so the humans, the guardians, and the Elu teamed up to stop them. After the war was over, though, the Elu haven't been seen since. Or have they? I'm sure we'll find out later. Talking to this teacher over here gives us a crest graph, which allows us to make magic spells. To determine the type of spell you create, two out of the four elements are combined together. This guy tells us what the four elements are, and okay, this really bothers me. Why is water associated with the black crest when there's already a blue crest? Instead, the blue crest is tied to earth, and it's just like... Why? Just make it tied to water. I mean, there's already a red crest attached to fire, so what, what are you guys doing? Alright, so we make our way over to Angie to get the pocket watch. But first, she wants us to use a teardrop to see if it has a reaction to this guardian stone. The teardrop is Cecilia's first tool and is an heirloom passed down in the Adelheid family. Of course, it does indeed react with the guardian stone, so you can be sure this will be a factor later on. Angie then gives Cecilia her second tool, the pocket watch. Now with that on our hands, let's go help out that lazy piece of shit from earlier. Let's grab a few items out of some barrels on the way though. Like I mentioned earlier, Wild Arms does reward you for exploring your environments, and I really like this. Since the pocket watch has the ability to reverse time and to reset objects to how they were previously, we used it to put the books back up on the shelves. After doing that though, one lone book remains. Upon opening it, the same mysterious voice that was calling out to us earlier tells us to go to the sealed library. It also tells us to let go of our ego again, which I don't really get as Cecilia hasn't shown any sign of that so far. Anyway, while we now know the sealed library exists, we don't know where to find it. As a kid, I remember getting lost here for a bit and not knowing what to do. In order to find out what to do, you need to do the classic RPG trope of talking to people to trigger something. The first person in this case being Sister Mary. However, she doesn't really help, but she just acknowledges that it exists while telling us to find it on our own since we're summoned by the guardians. The person next to her does say something about a light opening a door though. This person on a walkway outside mentions something about the statues in the courtyard facing away from each other. This other kid then tells us that the statues in the courtyard have secret switches. This conversation will not trigger unless you talk to Sister Mary first. So, let's go to the courtyard, press the switches, and make the statues face each other. Huh, nothing happens. Oh yeah, the whole light opening a door thing. We use a teardrop in the middle of the statues, and voila, a portal to the sealed library. This acts as Cecilia's dungeon, so hopefully you got the spell blast from that crest graph. It attacks all enemies and makes quick work of random encounters. Battles aren't really harder if you don't have it, they're just longer. Traversing through the dungeon itself is pretty simple. There's switches to press, boxes to throw, at switches, and stuff like that. This one puzzle shows us the handiness of the pocket watch. If you throw all the boxes in the room before hitting the switch, you're SOL. While you can just leave the room to reset it, you can also use the pocket watch to speed up the process. Now, we're in a library, and this is where we get a lot of lore. All the lore is definitely nice, I'm just not sure how I feel about them putting it behind optional books that not everyone's gonna read. The information itself, though, is quite interesting and flushes out the world a lot. Some books also hint at a couple of the optional super bosses, optional guardian runes, and some secret spells and a secret ability that Cecilia can unlock later on. There is a lot of optional side content in Wild Arms, so having some of it hinted at now was very good on their part. Now, there is one book I'm confused about though, and that's the Book of Kima. It reads that, long ago, a woman received a book from the heavens that contained information on alchemy and the creation of the universe. Maybe I just forgot or didn't talk to the right people, but I don't remember this ever getting brought up again. If someone knows what this is referring to, let me know in the comments. Alright, moving on, in order to proceed, we need to throw these three books into a fire. We do that, and in the next room, it's time to face a boss. After kicking its ass, the Guardian of Water appears and tells us how they were trapped in that book for ages by that demon. They also tell us that dark times lie ahead and that the battle for Fulgaia begins again. Fortunately, they give us their power to use as we are the innocent one. They end the speech by mentioning Lolithia again, but nothing really about it. Alright, 
Now we're back in Kieran Abbey talking to Sister Mary. Apparently, all female Adelheid descendants have the ability to speak with guardians. This is our destiny and burden to carry. I like how if you talk to her again, she says the guardians chose us and it's like, well, maybe not so much chose, but more, oh, you're the new Adelheid chick? Sup? Guess it's you who we talk to now. Cecilia's chapter then ends with her leaving the Abbey and getting some text about paving her own path. Now we're back on the character select screen with the goal of getting everyone to Adelheid, and this is where the story of Wild Arms truly begins. Well, sorta. A couple hours later, there's like a second opening where the opening credits roll after the major events of the game are kicked off. Basically, the demons come back and steal the teardrop from us with intentions to take over the world. After their attack on the kingdom, the King of Adelheid sadly dies due to injuries sustained. As the next in line, Cecilia should stay at home to watch after the kingdom with the king now gone. However, also being the one that can talk to guardians, she feels like she has to help out Fulgai in a more direct way. To symbolize the start of this new journey and change in character, she asks for Jack's sword and cuts off her own hair. This is a pretty common trope in fiction dating back to I don't know when, but in terms of JRPGs, I think this might be the first game to do this. Let me know if I'm wrong, but I think that's true. Most people probably know this trope from Garnett in Final Fantasy IX or maybe even Luke from Tales of the Abyss. However, my girl Cecilia did it first. Anyway, Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia then must team up together to get the teardrop back and protect Filgaia. Even before that happens though, I like that they actually have a valid reason to meet up and to join forces. Cecilia needs to go to Adelheid because, well, she's the princess. Jack wants to go there because he heard an ultimate power was nearby. And Rudy, well, he doesn't really have anywhere else to go and Adelheid is the closest place. Jack and Cecilia have also been named Drop Lilithia, so it only makes sense they want to check out its tomb. And Rudy was the cause of the earthquake, which in a result caused an incident at Lilithia's tomb, so he feels a sense of duty. Everyone not only has motivation to team up in the first place, but also to keep the camaraderie going. Cecilia is the only one that can communicate with guardians, and given how important they are in protecting the world, her significance is obvious. In fact, in some ways, she almost feels like the true main character, especially late in the game. I'll talk some more about that later. The same thing can also kind of be said for Jack, at least in terms of emotional connection. Before the events of the game take place, Jack was an honored Fenrir knight protecting the kingdom of Arctica. That is until one day the metal demons invaded and massacred everyone. For some reason, Arctica had this cocoon deep down underneath her kingdom that was actually the cocoon of the mother demon. This of course attracted the attention of the remaining demons hiding on the planet that wanted to revive their mother. With the sacrifice of the person he holds closest to him, he barely makes it out with his life. This is why Jack has been wandering ever since in search of the absolute power. He was powerless to protect his kingdom, his friends, and the love of his life. Because of this, he feels weak, guilty, and responsible for what happened. And you want to know the craziest thing about all this is? None of this scene is in the actual game. In order to witness this scene, you need to leave the title screen on idle for like 15 seconds and then it transitions into it. And that'd be fine if it was featured in the game too, but it's not. In result, a lot of players will probably miss this. I know I did as a kid. Even on this most recent playthrough, I saw it start up and I was like, oh, it'll probably appear later in the game, I'll just watch it then. I got near the end of the game and even got to Arctica and then it dawned on me like, it's never gonna show, is it? I don't know why they decided to do this. You do piece together these events later on, but still, it would have been nice to see it in game. Especially considering it's a really awesome scene. There are some poignant moments that are only amplified by some really great musical tracks not heard anywhere else in the game. Visually, there are some cool shots as well. I don't know, I just kind of thought this was a weird design choice. Anyway, going to Rudy now. His initial reason to team up isn't quite as strong as the others, but it's still there. Before the events of the game take place, Rudy's grandfather figure, Zepit, dies, leaving Rudy as an orphan. Sometime later, he arrived in Surf Village and was there until the beginning of the game. Given that he was then exiled from Surf Village and feels like an outsider that doesn't belong anywhere, it only makes sense for him to jump at the first chance to team up with someone who wants his company. There's some more I want to say about him right now, and also Jack and Cecilia for that matter, but I can't do that without going into spoiler territory, so I'm going to say that for later in the video. For now, let's switch things up and talk about the visuals.
Like I mentioned in the intro of this video, Wild Arms is styled more after a Super Nintendo game rather than a PS1 game. This isn't a bad thing though. Because of the obvious increase in power of the PlayStation over the SNES, Media Vision was able to execute this style to near perfection. Environments are just so colorful and detailed and character sprites have a lot of charm. And speaking of detail, I like how if you run across puddles of water in towns it changes the sound effects of your footsteps. It's a small touch, but a nice touch. What's not so nice, however, are the battle graphics. Yeah, these are pretty rough. Maybe the most dated aspect about the game. I get why they did it. 3D technology was new and novel at the time, and like I mentioned in the intro, it was actually praised upon release. But yeah, in hindsight, they've aged about as well as my old Zanga post from my middle school emo phase. By the way, what's up with some of the sound effects that some enemies make? There's literally two different types of cat sounds that are used when attacking certain enemies. I'm not joking. Like, tell me, do these enemies sound how you would expect them to sound? So weird. This might even be weirder than the elephant sounds used for dragons and Suikoden. Anyway, to sum up the graphics, 2D good, 3D bad. Now, when it comes to the actual presentation of the visuals, Wild Arms isn't necessarily the most cinematic. There are some cutscenes where the perspective changes though, and these look really cool. I just wish we got more of them. For example, the Kadingle Tower cutscene near the end of the game was awesome. Some more stuff like that would have been great. When it does do it though, it makes for some memorable moments. The flashbacks with Zepit come to mind. I mean, look at how chill this campfire scene is. So cozy. Really small nitpick. I do think the background depicting his grave could have been done a little bit better though. The way it appears in the opening movie is so cool and here, I mean, it still looks cool, I guess. It's just the color palette seems a little off to me. I feel like they could have contrasted the sky with the mountains better. The sky is just too blue in my opinion, so it blends in with the mountains. They should have either made the sky blacker or darker to give it more of a nighttime vibe, or made the mountains lighter in comparison. I don't know, just something different. What does nail the use of color though, is the photosphere where all the villains gather. This place just oozes atmosphere. The colors all pop so well and the music has this like sinister and foreboding vibe. When they combine it with the creepy maniacal laughter of mother, <laughs> man, just chills. They really did a great job in making these scenes interesting and impactful. On the topic of atmosphere, this is a great segue to talk about the absolutely incredible music in Wild Arms. To put it simply, the music in Wild Arms is iconic. It is outstandingly good. The composer, Michiko Naruki, is a goddess among mortals and deserves all the praise in the world. I do think she would even improve as the series goes on, but still, this first one is really spectacular. The Wild Western vibe is just captured so well. Also, that reminds me, quick tangent. The whole western aesthetic of this first game is admittedly kind of light as it would get a lot stronger later in the series. It's most prevalent in the music, the use of guns, and some character designs. The world's supposed to be a wasteland, so there are some deserty areas, but still, it's not like that much. There's definitely a lot of typical fantasy medieval stuff and even some sci-fi elements. The blend of medieval fantasy, the wild west, and sci-fi is really cool though with that said. I just thought this was worth mentioning at some point. Back to the music. While all the music is incredible, I think some of my favorite tracks are the town themes. These are extremely catchy and were stuck in my head for days. I mean hell, they still are. And seriously, amazing stuff here. What are some of your guys' favorite tracks? Let us know in the comments. With as deep as we are in the video now, some of you might be wondering why I haven't talked about the battle system yet. Well, let's go ahead and do just that. Combat in Wild Arms is pretty much as traditional as a turn-based system gets. To be completely honest, in this day and age, it will not hold the attention of every gamer and is perhaps one of the weaker aspects about it. With that said, it does get a bit more in depth later than it initially leads on. Let's go over the basics first. As options, of course you have attack, defend, use items, but then there's also skills and force. The skills are different for each character and act as their special moves. Rudy has arms, Cecilia has her magic, and Jack has fast draw techniques. Like I mentioned earlier, arms stand for ancient relic machines and can be found in special chests throughout the game. These are basically just special attacks that range in their enemies targeted, attack power, accuracy, and bullets. These stats can also be upgraded at various armsmiths and towns. This is where you can reload your bullets at as well, or you can always just use a bullet clip. Funny, for arms being such a supposed forbidden power, there's sure not a shortage of people out there working on them to make them even deadlier. As for Cecilia's magic, it's pretty self-explanatory. It works like it does in any other RPG. Getting your magic, though, is different. As I mentioned in Cecilia's section, you need to find crest graphs across the world and take them to a magic guild. 
There's white magic and black magic and later in the game you can even unlock a set of stronger spells for both. Finally, that leaves us with Jack and his fast draws. These work pretty similarly to Rudy's arms except they use MP instead of bullets, obviously. They do tend to range and effect a bit more though. Throughout the game, you'll learn hints for these techniques by talking to the right person, going to the right place, or accomplishing certain tasks. Quite a few of them are tied to these statues where you have to defeat a bunch of enemies as Jack alone. And after getting a hint, it'll appear as question marks in your skills, where you'll then have to use that in battle enough times till you eventually unlock it. Yeah, it's pretty much just RNG. Oh yeah, cool fact, but some of you guys may not know. There's actually a hidden fast draw technique only doable under certain conditions. It doesn't even appear in your skill menu. First, you have to use Shadow Bind on an enemy to paralyze them. Then, after they're paralyzed, you Shadow Bind on them again and it turns in a dark sweep. This does a massive amount of damage. I didn't know that until this most recent playthrough, so I just thought that was cool. Now, Force is kinda similar to skills, but also pretty different. Skills in Magic use NP while Force uses FP. FP is increased by either attacking or getting attacked. Each character has four different force abilities, which are basically like special abilities of sorts. When you have 25 FP, you can use your level 1 ability, 50 FP level 2, 75 FP level 3, and 100 FP level 4. You only start with your first ability though, as you learn the rest later on. Some of these are definitely more useful than others, so let's break them down real quick. Rudy's level 1 is Lock On. This makes sure your arm hits with 100% accuracy. I never really used this as a kid, but in this playthrough, I used it quite a bit early on. Even after upgrading, some arms accuracy is just okay, so this can be pretty helpful. His level 2 is a summon a guardian, which is also the same for everyone else. And given Rudy's shitty magic stat, you should never be doing this with him. Rudy's level 3 is protector, which allows him to take a hit for someone else. Honestly, never use this once. Maybe it has some uses, but that's a lot of FP to use when his level 4 is considerably more useful. Thematically and story-wise, it does make a lot of sense though, Rudy is the protector. His level 4 is Fury Shot, and this thing kicks ass. It triples the power of your arm, and hits with 100% accuracy. This will easily do the max damage of 9999. Jack's first ability is Accelerator, this makes him go first in battle. His level 3 is Sonic Vision, which triples his stats for a turn and guarantees a critical hit. Very useful. His level 4 is Double Command, and this thing is an absolute beast. After using Armor Down on enemies and Fury on Jack, you're going to be doing max damage with some fast draws, so yeah, this is pretty much an easy 20k in one turn. Even if not max damage, it'll be close enough, which is still a lot. Considering the final bosses only have like 40 to 50k HP, and even the hardest optional bosses have like 50 to 65k, you can see how overpowered this is. Cecilia's level 1 is Mystic, which brings out hidden abilities of items. It's pretty vague and they never explain what this is, so I never really bothered with this as a kid. Basically, if you use certain equipment as an item, it brings out a specific spell that doesn't use any MP. Think Dragon Quest. This I guess has its uses, but by far the biggest use is how Mystic works on healing items. It allows them to target all party members instead of just one. Given that Cecilia doesn't learn a multi-target healing spell until later in the game, this is very helpful early on. Her level 3 ability is High Guardian, which is just a stronger version of a normal Guardian Summon. Honestly, I never really summoned a whole lot, so I didn't use this that much. Her level 4 ability is Dual Cast, which allows her to cast two spells in one turn. Yup, very similar to Jack's Final Force ability and pretty much just as useful. Overall, I do really like the concept of the Force system, even if it's not necessarily the most balanced in this first game. I think later entries would improve upon this. Later entries would also drop the MP and just use FP only. With all that said, in addition to the abilities themselves, Force also has one more use. After reaching 100 FP, you trigger a condition green which gets rid of any status effect you may have had on that character. This is very helpful later on against some tough bosses that cause status effects. This also prevents you from getting status effect locked until death where you can't move or do anything. More RPGs could really use a mechanic like this. Malboros in Final Fantasy, I'm looking at you. Now, these are all your basic commands, however, there is also another overlooked one that can provide a lot of helpful advantages. That is the ability to change equipment mid-battle. Doesn't sound like much on the surface, but hear me out. If you go into a boss battle and find out they have an annoying attack that causes a certain status effect, you can switch to an accessory which negates that status effect, solving that issue. You do get a lot of these throughout your journey and can even buy them later on, so this is definitely viable. Now, did I really ever utilize this strategy? Well, no, but just knowing that I could have was nice. What I did utilize though was the goat doll strategy because I have absolutely no shame. 
After unlocking the secret black market later in the game, you can buy goat dolls which instantly revive you upon being killed. Given that you can change equipment mid-battle and can just put on a new one after using the old one, this means if you have enough goat dolls, you can never die. They're also not that expensive either, so this is very easy to do. So yeah, if you want to tear through the optional bosses with no difficulty, this is how you do it. I feel like this was an oversight. To make these that helpful and that cheap, I don't know. With that said, I did beat some of the optional bosses without cheesing this strategy, like all the golden bosses and Boomerang Flash. Barbados, I beat in the most epic fashion. Jack was my last person alive who would have died on the next hit and was going after the enemy. What to do in a situation like this? It seems like I'm screwed, right? Well, remember his Force Ability Accelerator, which lets him act first? That plus a Magnum Fang, and dude goes out with a bang. Moments like this in RPGs are so satisfying. Not all the optional bosses are equal, however. Some of them are quite a bit harder. Monster Zed, Angle Moa, and Ragu Ragula especially. Monster Zed causes a shit ton of status effects, and Angle Moa and Ragu Ragula just hit hard. I tried grinding for a while by battling those rare Hyokinsen enemies, but eventually I was like, you know what, they programmed goat dolls into the game, so I don't feel bad using them. I only ended up needing a few for Monster Zed and Angle Moa, so now it's time for Ragu Ragula, the hardest boss in the entire game. At this point, we've saved Fulgaia on numerous occasions, taken down the Demon Queen, some of the Quarter Knights, the sleeping demigod Angle Moa who that if he wasn't so bored he would take over the world, and everything else in between. Ragaragala was hinted at at the very beginning of the game as the King of Bees sleeping somewhere in Fulgaia and is the only optional boss who has its own dungeon leading up to it. I am expecting something so epic, something so terrifying, something that exudes power and fear. I finally reach the big moments, and my anticipation is going crazy. Here's how it plays out. What the hell? is this. Why does it look so derpy? Why do its arms just awkwardly and stiffly hang out like that with those weird little finger-like things sticking straight out? I mean, none of the boss polygons look that good, but most of them at least look better than this. Thankfully, its design in the second game would be improved exponentially. Anyway, as for the fight itself, I got it down super close to where only one more hit would have taken it out and it was like, holy shit, I'm actually about to beat it legitimately. And then... A volcanic bomb just shattering my hopes and dreams. Did kill him on the next hit though, just like I thought I would. A lot of his difficulty really just comes down to RNG. If it doesn't use that move, you're fine, but if it does, well, GG. Man, this kind of reminds me of the last point about the battle system that I want to make. My biggest gripe with the combat is that it's just pretty one note overall and doesn't call for a variety of tactics to be used. I mean, yeah, it's nice that Cecilia has access to a wide array of spells, all with differing effects. However, the problem is, is that you barely ever need to use more than a handful. The strategy basically stays the same all throughout the game, even against the hardest bosses. Use armor down twice on a boss, buff if necessary, spam Rudy's strongest arms and Jack's strongest fast draws, and heal when needed. That is essentially it. Sometimes there are curveballs with status effects and stuff, but generally speaking, this is the strategy. Along with casting Hyper on Jack, which doubles his attack power and high shielding the party, this is the strategy I utilized against every optional boss as well. The system is pretty basic at its core, so I'm not really sure what they could have done to fix this, but yeah. If you're looking for super in-depth and complex combat, Wild Arms probably ain't it. Exploration on the other hand though, now that's a different story. Due to the tool system, Wild Arms is leagues above most of its peers. Like if we're comparing it to other early 2D PS1 RPGs that came out before Final Fantasy VII, even though I really love the game and would consider it on similar levels, games like Suikoden are super basic in this aspect. You're just walking through boring corridors, really. It just makes you appreciate the exploration in this game even more. They take a page out of Lufia 2's book and even 2D Zelda's. If this sounds awesome, that's because it is. As I mentioned earlier in the video, each character has four different tools, so let's briefly go over them. Rudy's first tool is bombs. You can blow up objects and hidden passageways. A true staple of the series, it would be featured in every game. His second tool is radar. This scans the screen and lets you know if there are any hidden items nearby. Pretty helpful. 
His third tool is the roller skates, and okay, these are extremely helpful. They let you pass by terrain that would normally hurt you, and when using them, there are no random encounters. This is by far the biggest use form, as you will be doing this a lot. The only trade-off is that you can't turn or stop when using them unless you run into a wall. This means there are some situations where they can't be used, but more often than not, spam them whenever you can. His fourth tool is the Power Glove, which lets you punch down some walls and objects, and lets you punch other objects like grappling hook posts into place. You get this very late in the game and rarely ever use it. Jack's first tool is Handpan, and I already talked about what he does during his chapter. His second tool is a lighter, which lets you light up lamps and torches and burn down grass. Yeah, I'm sure many people already knew about that second use. This isn't really used that much throughout the game though, aside from some puzzles here and there. His third tool is a grappling hook, and this is used quite a bit. This is basically just a hook shot from Zelda, except you can only use it on specific grappling hook posts. Jack's final tool is a guitar of Maya, and this is actually not even needed to beat the game. It just summons three optional bosses, Sado and Lucifer in the final dungeon, and Ragaragala in the abyss. You'll know where these are by a little circle on the ground. Cecilia's first tool is a teardrop, and this is more used for story purposes more than anything. Her second tool is a pocket watch, and I already went over that during her chapter. Her third tool is the rod, and this lets you talk to animals. Sometimes it's needed to progress, but most of the time it's just fun flavor text into the mind of animals. Her final tool is the vase, and this just lets you put out fire. Walking around with a huge vase kind of seems impractical, but you could just cast a water spell, but hey, what do I know? And these are all the tools in the game. As you can see, not all of them are as viable as some others, but still, this is a very nice and welcome mechanic overall. Later entries would polish this system a bit. In this first game, though, it still adds good variety to exploration, which I really love. When it comes to the puzzles, they're pretty simple for the most part, so you don't really have to worry about anything overly difficult to where you're gonna get stuck. There was maybe a part or two where I looked up a guide, but that was mainly just because I was being lazy. They give you all the information needed in-game, and everything is fairly intuitive. Well, besides that one book puzzle in De La Metallica. They really dropped the ball here. This was an infamous run-ender of many gamers back in the day. Due to a messy translation during this part, most people will not be able to beat this without a guide. I would argue like almost none of you even, it's pretty much required. It's the most glaringly bad puzzle and really just dungeon in general in the entire game. The forest prison sucked too and was easy to get lost. Screw that place. I mentioned it earlier, but the sprinting mechanic also just adds another fun layer to exploration. It almost becomes like this mini game of its own trying to perfectly time corners and stuff. It's pretty fun. It's also pretty fun to seek out and find Rudy's arms, Jack's fast draw techniques, and Crest Grass for Cecilia. I've always loved collect-a-thons, and this kind of gives it a small element of that. Considering they also make your character stronger as well, this just makes finding them even more exciting and rewarding. There are a few that are missable though, which is kind of an unforgiving design choice. Oh well, nothing that looking up a quick missable guide can't fix. There's also a missable optional boss and guardian rune early in the game, but I sort of like how this one is handled though. In terms of overworld exploration, this is also done very well. You go from walking on foot, to a ship, to a golem, and then to an airship thing. Or a metal bird, I think that's what it's called. Each subsequent traversal method lets you go across terrain that was previously inaccessible. The sense of progression is natural and satisfying. There's also no random encounters in either the golem or the metal bird. This is super nice. I'm adding this part in after the initial recording, but I also really like how the same thing applies to the LU dimension with no random encounters. It makes sense given the context and just gives it this peaceful atmosphere. I've always been a fan of the floating land aesthetic. It gives me zeal vibes from Chrono Trigger. There's also just a lot of secrets to find too. There's items in the water, secret dungeons, secret guardian runes, and hell there's even some locations not marked by anything, forcing you to be directly on it in order to tell it's even there. The game hints at this though by starting to zoom in whenever you're getting close to something. I love this. It encourages you to explore while still throwing you a bone. It is just a great overworld map overall and really makes me miss them in modern RPGs. Alright, so I've talked a lot about the aspects that I think Wild Arms does really well, however it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There are some things that I either wasn't crazy about or that I think they could have improved upon. I mentioned just a bit ago how puzzles are fairly intuitive, but progression on the other hand though, not always. There's definitely a few moments where it's a little old school in design and doesn't really give you clear direction on where to go. Thankfully, these moments don't happen very often, like maybe two or three times. Usually you can find this out by talking to the right person or something, but it's just not always made that obvious. There's this one time early in the game where you need every duplicator possible up until that point in order to proceed, so you better hope you've been exploring thoroughly. By the way, I don't like how there's not enough duplicators in the game to open up every chest and door. You'll either have to steal some or get them as a rare drop. 
This is honestly an annoying design choice. I know that every duplicator door doesn't hide that great of items, but you don't know that in the moment. You'll either just get mad you wasted one for shitty items or reload an earlier save. I'm not gonna lie, to avoid this, I did use the item duplication glitch with no shame. Yeah, I know, I'm a big fat phony. This is very easy to do and lets you create 255 copies of any item you already have. If you want, you can absolutely break the game by duplicating a bunch of stat apples and stuff, but that just takes the fun away. I used it for duplicators in, and that's it. I also noticed a few errors in the script. This isn't really that bad at all, especially for the time, I just noticed a few of them there at the end and thought it was worth pointing out. The actual dialogue itself, though, is quite good overall. I would say that it's better than a lot of its peers from around the same time. My only real criticism is that sometimes the flow from one point to the next can be a little bit disjointed. I'm not sure if this is due to the translation or just how the script is. The writing in and of itself is good though. It's nowhere near as stiff as some other PS1 RPGs from that era, like The Legend of Dragoon or Legend of Ligaia. With that said, I don't want to give it too much praise either though. The writing is above average for sure, but not as good as some later PS1 RPGs. There's also this moment where the USS Missouri is referenced and it's just like... why? That does not exist in this universe. If it was like Lunar where some random NPCs have some pop culture references here and there, that would be fine I guess, but this happened in a story scene and it just took me out. Thankfully, this was the only time I noticed this. Now, where Wild Arms does stand is one of the best on the console, in my opinion at least, is with its characters. And from the main cast to the supporting cast to the villains, Wild Arms has some incredibly memorable characters. Let's start with the supporting cast. There's such an overlooked aspect in JRPGs as I feel like everyone focuses on the main cast and villains, but they really help the world feel fleshed out. The reason why Wild Arms does this so well is after you meet an important NPC, they remain a presence all throughout the game. Well, not all of them, but most of them at least. In so many JRPGs, you'll meet someone who plays an important role during that segment, then you never see them again. Not in Wild Arms. In characters like Calamity Jane, her servant McDolan, Professor Emma, Captain Bartholomew, and Mariel all stay relevant throughout your entire journey. I really love this. It allows you to grow more attached to them. The developers were aware of their significance as they decided to make most of them playable in the Alter Code F remake. In the original game though, they still form like this special team with the main cast where they have meetings and stuff. It's pretty cool and wholesome. It definitely inspired the Agile Remote Mission Squad from Wild Arms 2. What also inspired Wild Arms 2 is the main cast themselves. They basically just made Rudy, Cecilia, and Jack over again with Ashley, Lilka, and Brad. They almost kind of serve as prototypes for them. With that said, that doesn't mean they weren't done well in this first game though. I think they're an awesome cast with cool designs and great development. I'm gonna talk about why I think that is and as a heads up, I'm gonna be going into major spoiler territory. I'm gonna be doing the same with the villains and the ending as well. These will be marked by chapter, so if you want to just skip to my closing thoughts, feel free to do so now. Let's start with the main man himself, Rudy Rough Knight. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Just an iconic design. When I think of blue-haired heroes, Rudy, along with Ryu from Breath of Fire and Vaughn from Legend of Legaia, instantly come to mind. The headband is just such a cool look. In Wild Arms, Rudy represents hope. The hope that there's some good in everyone and that you want to help the world and protect people not because you think it's the right thing, but because you know it's the right thing. You feel it in your heart and act out of natural instinct and a sense of compassion, not a sense of duty. Before meeting Jack and Cecilia and besides Zeppet of course, Rudy has been shown animosity throughout most of his life for being different. Throughout the game it's hinted at that Rudy has this like special power within him and is why he's able to utilize a bunch of different arms instead of just one. Later on we find out that Rudy is actually a home cross, an artificial being created by the Elu that's comprised of the same metals that make up demons. And yes, Home Cross is a mistranslation of the common term, homunculus. These were essentially killing machines and grew to be so dangerous and powerful they had to dispose of all of them. All of them except one. It wasn't until Zeppet later took him in that Rudy finally started to learn love and compassion and what it means to be human. 
Zeppet is also a mistranslation of Geppetto, as this was supposed to be like a Pinocchio-type relationship. Zeppet knew that one day, Rudy's powers would be called upon to protect Filgaia, so he did everything he could to prepare him for that moment. This whole premise has a lot of similarities to Trigun, I feel. Rudy and Vash are both like these destructive weapons that have the potential to cause chaos wherever they go. However, they would just rather be nice and help people instead. They also come from more sci-fi backgrounds before drifting the wasteland and had a guardian figure that showed them love and compassion. The Trigun manga did come out before Wild Arms, but Wild Arms probably was in development for a while, so it's hard to tell what inspired what. And yes, I am aware that the developers are fans of Trigun, as there's even a poster of Vash's Stampede in Wild Arms 2. Anyway, that's getting off topic. I think Rudy is an awesome protagonist with an interesting background and great journey. He's only really held back by the whole silent protagonist thing. He does technically have one speaking line, however, this was not in the Japanese version, nor was it included in the remake. Canonically speaking, he is silent. This just ultimately limits what they can do with his character and why I'm a bigger fan of Ashley from Wild Arms 2. It's just harder to feel connected to someone who can't talk, you know? Also, for being this supposed killing machine, there's not really many, if any, moments that show incredible feats of power. I feel like something like this could have really helped drive home the point just how much more powerful and different he was than others. Even in in-game combat, he starts off quite strong and then grows to be your arguably least useful member. Jack basically does everything he does, but better. Oh well. Near the beginning of the video, I mentioned how Rudy's not really the main protagonist, and that's because in Wild Arms, there are three protagonists. Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia all share equal spotlight. Cecilia, perhaps the most, though, but we'll get to her in a bit. Let's talk about Jack right now. I think he's my favorite character in the game. He's got a cool design, and I've always been a fan of straight shooters who tell it how it is. In Wild Arms, Jack Van Buris represents courage, the courage needed to protect your loved ones and those you care about. How he finds this courage is something I really love. In the opening cutscene, Jack failed to protect the Kingdom of Arctica and his love, Elmina. We're led to believe that Elmina was killed by the demons, however, this was not the case. Kind of the opposite, actually. The main villain group is the Quarter Knights, and we'll talk about them in a bit, but one of them is called Lady Harkin. In our first encounter with her, we see that she uses the same fast draw style as Jack. Huh, I wonder why. Well, it turns out that instead of killing her, the demon Alhazad turned her into a demon herself. Jack eventually pieces this together and knows what he needs to do. He couldn't protect her back then, but he can protect her now and help her see the light. I really love that flashback we get of them both. We see them playing hooky from the knighting ceremony to catch a view of the town. Being the newest member of the Fenrir Knights, Jack, or Garrett as he was still known as back then, is searching for his role within the group. Elmina says he needs to find something worth protecting, but Jack already knows what that is. Her. This lets Chief Coldbird know exactly what Jack is meant to do. Coldbird himself is the armor, Commander Ryan is the shield, Elmina is the attack, in other words the sword. So what does that make Jack? The handguard that protects the sword, the Van Buris. Wait, what? Yeah, this is another mistranslation, it's supposed to be Van Brace, another word for a gauntlet or a handguard. This translation error makes this scene make no sense, it kinda sucks. The actual idea behind it all though, I really love. Jack always knew what he wanted to protect, so when he couldn't protect her, he felt lost. He eventually realizes that just because he couldn't protect Elmina back then, doesn't mean he still can't protect others in the present and future. He never needed to go searching for the absolute power. He always had it within him. Protecting with his blade is his power. At the beginning of the game, Jack is wandering around aimlessly searching for some power that he doesn't even know what it is. By the end of the game, Jack has found his true purpose and calling in life. This is reflected well in the ending when he says his journey isn't over as his blade is still needed. It's just a great character arc overall. All right, let's talk about the final member of the main cast, Cecilia. Maybe the true main character? I don't know. In Wild Arms, Cecilia represents love. The love shown to those you care about and acting out of that love in your heart, as opposed to some moral obligation. Throughout the game, Cecilia heavily struggles with her duties as a princess and being the one that can talk to guardians. It's not a life she asked for, but she has to bear that burden regardless. At first, she's only doing stuff because she feels like it's her responsibility and that she has to. After various events and witnessing a flashback dream sequence with Rudy and Zeppet, she eventually realizes that if you want to be loved, you have to love first. How can she expect people to love her as a princess when she hates being one herself? Rudy helps her find the love in her heart. 
Apparently, this love is supposed to be like a romantic type love as they would expand upon this in the Ultra Code F remake. However, in this original version, I never really took it that way. It always seemed more like the type of love you would have for a sibling or a great friend. Personally, I kind of like the brother-sister dynamic over the whole romantic partner thing, especially considering Jane already loves Rudy and I'm not really a huge fan of love triangles. Multiple scenes strongly imply that Jane has romantic feelings for Rudy and I just like that better. But yeah, the whole Cecilia helping Rudy wake up from his dream sequence is pretty awesome. He's stuck in a dream living out his happiest memories, but memories are just that. Memories. It's okay to reflect on them sometimes, but they shouldn't stop you from facing reality in the present. In Rudy's case, he's got a world to protect and a destiny to fulfill. This whole concept reminds me of the similar dream segment from Gurren Lagann. Man, I love that scene. Anyway, the reason why Cecilia kind of feels like the true main character is not only because of her connection to the Guardians and the Earth Golem, but because the epilogue is told from her perspective and pretty much wraps up her coming-of-age story. I'll talk about the ending in more detail here in a bit, but first, the villains in Wild Arms definitely deserve some spotlight. Earlier I mentioned that there was a group of villains called the Quarter Knights. The Quarter Knights are comprised of the four top-ranked demons that serve directly under Mother, the first of which is Belcel, a mistranslation of Berserk. He's your stereotypical brawn over brain type brute and is the first demon your party fights against. This bad guy trope is often the weakest member of the group, as are usually surpassed by those that are either more cunning or have more technical skill. In Wild Arms, this is no exception as he's the first one to go and dies before the halfway point. The next quarter knight is Alhazad, who I briefly mentioned earlier. He's technically the first demon you see as he's in the opening cutscene in Arctica. He's both the most intelligent member of the group and the most sadistic. Unlike Siegfried, he doesn't really care about ruling the world. He just wants a place to experiment on and torture humans. He figuratively and literally covers up this psychopathic nature with an elegant white robe. It conceals what lies beneath, his true form and nature. An ugly, hideous monstrosity. I like this concept along with his design. The way he floats around just gives him this memorable presence. He remains a constant threat throughout the entire game, however, you don't fight him until the very end, so it's very satisfying to finally beat the shit out of him. Next up, we have Lady Harkin. I talked about her during Jack's section, so I'll keep this fairly brief. I never did the side quest as a kid, but after freeing Elmina from the persona that is Lady Harkin, there's actually a way to revive her when she dies. The Guardian of Time says there's a way to bring her back, however, Jack doesn't want her to remember any of the sins she committed as Lady Harkin. The Guardian of Time says this is possible, but in doing so, she won't remember Jack either. Even though this is not ideal, it's the only way, so Jack agrees. She can later be found in the Malama Village pub and, yup, she doesn't remember anything, even her name. Jack tells her his name and gives her back her ribbon that he received way earlier in the game. She asks if he's ever going to see her again, to which he replies, probably, someday. I really love this. It leaves things a bit ambiguous while still implying that they're probably gonna reconnect. If they're truly meant to be, it doesn't even matter that she doesn't remember them. They'll still find a way to form a new connection all over again. Not everything always needs to be wrapped up tightly with a bow to have a satisfying conclusion. This is a great example of that. Before we go on to the last quarter nights, let's talk about Zed. Zed is essentially the comic relief villain of the game. No one really takes him seriously, whether enemies or allies. He's constantly trying to get the approval of the Quarter Knights by showing that he's this badass warrior hero. This comedic yet triumphant tone is reflected nicely in his theme. When Bell Selk is defeated, he thinks he's finally gonna get his moments, however, he's passed up again. He eventually realizes that none of the Quarter Knights give a shit about him, so he leaves, never to return again. Unless you go to Saint Centaur, that is. Earlier in the game, this town was attacked and basically everyone was killed by demons. Everyone except this little blind girl near the outskirts of town. This is pretty heartbreaking. However, if you go to visit her near the end of the game, she says that some funny guy has been coming out to visit her and spend time with her. It turns out this person is Zed. He's found true happiness in paradise taking care of this girl. She can't see that he's a demon and accepts him for who he is on the inside. He doesn't want to give up this happiness and is willing to fight for it. After a super annoying boss fight where he causes like every status effect, we decide to let him live. He's finally found a purpose to life other than fighting and seems to be on the right path. He drops the second strongest sword in the game for Jack, which always lowers his luck to the worst level. This is pretty fitting, Zed's always had shitty luck throughout the game, so by him dropping this, it's like severing the ties of that past. In the Alter Code F remake, he actually joined your party as a playable member here, but not in this version. 
Overall, Zed's a solid character with a great arc. With that said, even though I really like him, he's not my favorite antagonist in the game. That title belongs to Boomerang. Holy shit, this dude is cool. He has multiple themes even, which really gives him this impactful presence on screen. It's such an awesome vibe. Even his first appearance is cool as hell. After Bell Selk is killed, they need a new fourth member of the Quarter Knight, so here enters Boomerang. Siegfried's the leader, and even he's like, wait, I, I don't know about this guy. He's known as a cannibal and executioner. In the war against the demons a thousand years back, he actually fought against the demons. That's not because he was trying to save the world or anything, go oh, no. He has allegiance to no one and simply desires the heat of battle. He always thirsts for combat and battling against strong demons did quench some of that thirst. He only teams up with the demons now for a similar reason. He heard the humans are strong and desires to test them in battle. Because his desire for battle is so strong, the Guardian of Desire, Lucy, has even teamed up with him. In Cecilia's chapter, there's this one book that reads many years ago during the war, one of the Guardians sided with the demons. That was Lucy and Boomerang. The reason why they even need a new Quarter Knight in the first place is because Boomerang killed Belselk. Throughout the game, we come to see that Boomerang doesn't really care about any of the demons' ideals. He's only doing what he does because he wants to fight and test the humans. By the end of the game, he even grows to sort of be an ally as he respects our strength. After we beat him for the final time at the entrance to Kadingle, Siegfried's finally had enough of his loose cannon-like behavior and sends a bunch of demons down to kill both him and us. Boomerang does the whole classic, nah, I got this fam, you guys go ahead. He says they're gonna take a little trip to hell together, and if the humans can turn hope into power, then he can turn desire into a blade. God, this guy's cool. If you exit back out the same way, you can find his weapon on the ground, the Saber Fang, while his theme plays in the background. The description reads, I'll be back. Yes, this is not the end of Boomerang. There's this optional arena side quest, and after defeating four strong monsters at the arena, the strongest one of them all comes out to play. Boomerang has returned from hell, stronger than ever. He's actually known as Boomerang Flash now, as his desire to return from hell was so strong that he merged with the Guardian of Desire itself to create the ultimate blade. Hey, he did say he could turn desire into a blade after all. The man called his shot. He sports a new black and red design to symbolize him emerging from the fiery pits of hell. This gives me Shishio vibes from Aroni Kenshin when he's in hell and he's all like, oh, I'm dead? Guess I'll just conquer hell now. Even after beating him, he has one of the most badass deaths in all of RPGs. I mean, just look at how cool his last words are. Looks like this is the end. Did I lose? No, I did not. I lived the life of a demon warrior. I fought and lost my life. I was not defeated. I lived a life of my own dreams. I have lived. I have no regrets. I am a winner. My death is glorious. Alright, I'm just gonna say it. Boomerang is one of the GOAT RPG antagonists, at least in terms of coolness factor. My life goal is that whenever my time expires, I want to have that same mentality when going out. He went out on his own terms, and I respect the hell out of that. So yeah, as if I haven't made it obvious enough, huge fan of Boomerang. Now, that leaves us with the last two villains, Siegfried and Mother. Siegfried is a mistranslation of Siegfried, and he is the leader of the Quarter Knights. First of all, I love his design. Big plate of armor, huge ass sword, what's not to love? I never even realized it until now, but it's eerily similar to Nightmare's design from Soul Calibur, actually. Plus, Nightmare's human form is named Siegfried, so, I mean, come on. This seems extremely obvious. The first Soul Calibur game, Soul Blade, did come out before Wild Arms, so my first thought was Wild Arms was clearly inspired by it, but I don't know, actually. If you look at Siegfried's design in the original Soul Blade, he looks kind of more like a normal warrior just with a big sword. Siegfried is a legendary hero from German mythology after all, so it's just a take on that. When Wild Arms came out one year later, not only did this Siegfried iteration have bulkier armor, but he also had a giant sword with an eyeball looking thing on it. His final form that is Zeke Tuvai would only exaggerate this further. Soul Calibur came out a year and a half later and oh, what do you know? All of a sudden Nightmare has bulkier armor and an eyeball looking thing on his sword. His sword is also now shaped similarly to Siegfried's sword too. So yeah, I think it's safe to say that Nightmare was inspired by Siegfried. Alright, tangent aside, Siegfried's homeworld of Hyades was destroyed, so he wants to revive Mother to make Phil Gaia their new home. However, little does he know that Mother is not on the same page. 
After Mother is revived, she's all like, destruction to all, beauty lies in destruction, and Siegfried's like, <laughs> yeah, sure, uh, is, is that when we get to rule the world? And Mother's all like, rule? What the hell are you talking about? There's gonna be nothing left to rule after I'm done with this place. Siegfried's like, wait, so we're not fighting for a second home? Are we taking back our old place then, or what? So then Mother's all like, wait, what, Hades? Nah, dude, I fucking destroyed that place, the same thing's gonna happen here too. I like how Siegfried looks back really quick, as you can tell he's panicking on the inside. He's probably thinking, Ah, oh, man, I instantly regret this. Confused, he then asks, So, what are we gonna do after we destroy this place? So then Mother's all like, Oh yeah, here's the best part. You guys are all gonna die too. She thinks having the privilege to die by her hand is the ultimate beauty in pretty much heaven. This scene then ends, but needless to say, the seeds of doubt have been planted in Siegfried's mind. To no one's surprise, Siegfried eventually plans to overthrow Mother, and with our help, that does happen. However, even with the threat of Mother now gone, Siegfried and the rest of the Quarter Knights still want to take over Filgaia. After a showdown with Siegfried at the Gate Generator, he pulls out a desperation tactic. He attaches this chain-like wire to Rudy, so if Siegfried's going down in the Gate Generator, Rudy's going with him. This is also how we come to later find out that Rudy is made of metal. It's too strong for Rudy to cut with a sword, so he chooses to cut off his own arm instead. Siegfried is then sucked up by the gate generator and winds up back at the photosphere of all places. This is where we took down Mother earlier in the game, but guess what? She's not actually dead. She ends up getting her revenge on Siegfried and eats him alive. It's a pretty unsettling scene. When Wild Arms isn't using cat sound clips, the sound effects are quite good. At this point, we've gone from Mother being the main villain to Siegfried and now back to Mother again. This back and forth dynamic only continues throughout the rest of the game. I like this quite a bit. It keeps you guessing who's going to be the final boss up until the very end. On that note, I'm going to talk about the ending before I move on to my final thoughts on the game as it really resonated with me. So, after trekking all the way up to the top of the Tower of Kadingal, we take the dimensional elevator up to Malduk. Malduk is this floating colony in the sky that has a weapon that can destroy all of Filgaia. Siegfried, under the control of Mother, plans to do just that. She didn't actually eat him earlier, but more just became a part of him so he can be controlled. Since I defeated all the optional bosses before this, we're strong as shit and absolutely wreck this dude. After beating him though, Mother goes from just influencing him to consuming him completely. The rejoining of a mother and her child, the ultimate beauty, mother free. I really like this concept, it's kind of poetic in a way. Now commences the true final boss and yep, we kick her ass. Unfortunately, it's too late though as the darkness tear is still going to consume Filgaia. All hope seems to be lost, however, hope actually ends up being the reason why Filgaia is saved. The group isn't willing to give up Filgaia and through that pure hope and will to protect, the true, absolute power of the teardrop and the Guardians is unleashed. The Guardians tell us with sheer faith we can create a better future, and if enough people care for the planet, the flow of decay can be reversed. I can't remember if I mentioned it earlier, but due to the ramifications of the war a thousand years back, Filgaia has been decaying ever since and has been turning into a wasteland. I guess that was kind of important to point out. Anyway, I really like this message, and it's more relevant than ever, unfortunately. How this all comes together might be a little bit cheesy for some, but as we discussed earlier, hope is a big theme in Wild Arms after all, so it's only fitting that it would be the thing to save the day. Humans are the true guardians of Filgaia, and with our hope, we hold the key to the future. This is not the end, but a new beginning. So, with all that wrapped up, let's make a little victory lap back to Filgaia as some triumphant music plays in the background. Very cool vibe. Time for a cozy ride down the dimensional elevator and la di da 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 holy shit what the hell is that? Against all odds, Siegfried is still somehow alive and assumes the form of Zeke Tuvai. I like how everyone's all, wait, I thought mother ate you and he's like, nah, she sucks so I had to ditch her and return from hell. 
The old bitch sucked. We had to ditch her. Yeah, I was obviously just pulling your leg earlier, as this is the actual true final boss. I like Zeke as an overall villain better than Mother, so I like that they gave him the final cap off here. After finally killing him once and for all, we're now back down at the base of the tower with it about to collapse. This would crush us in the rubble, so things are not looking good. But wait, what is this? Yes, the Earth Golem coming to Iron Giant and save us all. Between the implications, the Golem acting on its own, and the choir in the background, this is just a really cool scene. Cecilia then says goodbye to the Earth Golem in a very touching moment. The music really sets the somber mood here. The screen then pans over to various spots on the overworld map before focusing back on Jack and Rudy walking across some lone road. Okay, needs to be said, the whistling tune here is so good. Shout out to the whistling goat Hiro Horiguchi as listed in the credits. I couldn't find out any more information about him, but wherever you are, thanks for blessing us with that heavenly set of pipes. Anyway, Jack and Rudy are reflecting on their journey and all the events that have transpired. Well, more just Jack, I guess, since Rudy doesn't talk. We pull out a letter that Cecilia wrote for us, and this is where things shift to her perspective as we read it. She recounts how the Earth Golem protected all of them and now rests in an eternal slumber, never to wake up again. It was created to be a fighting machine, however, there is no longer a fight to be fought. That combined with the fact that Jack and Rudy are going off on their next journey while Cecilia has to stay home at Adelheid and watch after the kingdom, causes her to feel lonely. They helped her out on our journey so much and she thought they would always be together. It then takes a break from Cecilia narrating the letter and flashes back to some events that happened beforehand. We get some wholesome scenes here like the crew laughing away and my main man Jack having to keep the ladies off him. Big fan of the music too. We then see Jack and Rudy leaving Adelheid to embark on their next journey. Jack says that Filgaia is still filled with monsters, so his sword will be needed. Him and Rudy are following the desires in their hearts and setting out on their own path. Cecilia really respects this, so much so that she's choosing to do the same thing. She's going to follow her own heart's desires as well. It's time for her to start doing what she wants to do, not what she feels like she has to do. She no longer wants to be the perfect princess. She just wants to be an ordinary 17-year-old girl. So, she leaves the kingdom in the hands of Minister Johan, and sets out to protect what she cares for, which just so happens to be Filgaia. This is her new desire. In addition to hope, love, and courage, desire is also a big theme in Wild Arms. Obviously there's Boomerang and his desire for battle, but all three of the main characters learn to follow their desires as well. With Cecilia finally setting out on her own path, her coming of age journey is complete. She wraps up her letter with a P.S. The two of you should be receiving something that you forgot from Adelheid soon. Don't be lazy. Make sure you take it. Cut back to Rudy, Jack, and Handpan in the present. They're all happy for Cecilia and that she's finally following her own free will. Now, I could describe this next scene, but I'm just gonna let it play out so you guys get the full effect. Enjoy. I had the biggest dumb cheesy smile on my face when this happened. I mean, yeah, it's cliche, but it's just executed so well. The way the main melody of the song syncs up with her turning around laughing, I just got like oddly emotional. It brought me back to simpler times and gave me this warm, comforting, nostalgic feeling. 
I also love how this scene shows the dynamic that they have formed and how well they know each other now. In her letter, Cecilia said don't be lazy to make sure you take it and that's exactly what Jack was going to do when he couldn't figure out what it was. Even before that, Jack is ripping on Rudy in a big brother-like way as he thinks he's the one that forgot something. Honestly, I wish moments like this would have happened more throughout the actual game. The cast plays off each other well, it just doesn't happen as often as I would like. Anyway, with the trio now back together, our journey across Filgaia once again begins. Man, I wish we could get a spin-off adventure of them three. No world-ending threat, just them traveling the lands, fighting monsters, and doing good deeds. Our group then looks out from a cliff and reflects on our friends that got us here, while the camera pans up to a beautiful shot of the background. This is how Wild Arms finally ends. I really love the melody that comes into play here, as it's a different take on the theme from the anime opening. Very fitting. The credits then roll and show a lot of cool art of the characters not seen anywhere else. We'll show some of these as the song plays out before I go on to my closing thoughts. Overall, I really enjoyed my time with Wild Arms. Nostalgia aside, out of all the retrospectives we've done on our channel so far, this has definitely been one of the more enjoyable experiences for me. It's a very traditional RPG while still doing just enough things different to give it its own identity and flavor. Flat out, it's just fun. It really clicked for me one night when I had the lights dimmed, I had a drink, a little snack with me, I was buying new weapons in town about to tackle the next dungeon and I was just like, I'm having a good ass time, this is really fun. I was having so much fun, I even 100% completed it. Something that I haven't done with any other game that we've made a retrospective on. That's gotta mean something. It's just pretty well paced for the most part and doesn't wear out its welcome. With just the main story, I was about to beat in a little bit over 30 hours and with the side content, it was a little bit closer to 35 to 40 hours. In our video about length in RPGs, I said that this was just about the perfect length for me. In fact, to improve the pacing a bit further, I think there's even a few dungeons or so that could have been trimmed off without hurting the overall narrative. This is an extremely small nitpick though, which is perfectly fine in its current state. As an overall game, Wild Arms is the complete package. I think its strongest aspects are the great cast of characters, the memorable villains, the fun exploration, the unique setting, the incredible music, and the engaging enough story. From beginning to end, it's just a quality experience. I don't necessarily consider it an absolute pinnacle of the genre like I might with games like Chrono Trigger or Final Fantasy IX, but in terms of the best PS1 RPGs and the greatest 2D RPGs of all time, Wild Arms certainly deserves a spot somewhere on those lists. If I'm comparing it to other early PS1 2D RPGs like Breath of Fire 3 and Suikoden, and yes, Beyond the Beyond doesn't even deserve to be in that comparison, I personally think that Wild Arms is the best and most complete game. Suikoden is super fun to replay due to its short length and fast paced battle system, it's just not as fleshed out in the villain department and arguably story. Plus, as I mentioned earlier, exploration is just lackluster. Breath of Fire 3 has a great story, characters and music, but battles move slow and random encounters are frequent. Meanwhile, in Wild Arms with the roller skates and the spell Invisible, random encounters aren't nearly as bad. That's not to say Wild Arms is perfect though, it does have some flaws. The 3D battle graphics have not aged well, progression can be a little bit too vague at times, and the script could be a little bit better overall. However, these are all very minor complaints in the grand scheme of things. I think that Wild Arms holds up extraordinarily well and is well worth the time of any RPG fan, especially more old school ones. It's just given me so many great memories over the years and honestly, with this most recent playthrough, I appreciate it more now than I ever have before. It's clear the developers put so much heart and passion into it and it really shows. The game is just full of charm. It's not just great memories that Wild Arms has given me though, but a lesson on life as well. With a little bit of hope, love, and courage, you can do just about anything that your heart desires. Never stop chasing those dreams.
All right, that wraps up this extremely long retrospective. When I first got to working on it, I was like, this one will maybe be 40-some minutes, similar to our Breath of Fire 4 and Chrono Cross videos, and, well, as you can see, I kind of got carried away. I just have such a nostalgic connection to the game, and I really enjoy this recent playthrough, more so than ever before. On top of our videos getting longer and longer, the more I like a game, the more I'm going to feel compelled to say about it, you know? Stay tuned for our 3-minute Beyond the Beyond retrospective next week. For real though, not all of our retrospectives may be quite this long going forward, as it just depends on the game. If you guys want to see us cover more Wad Arms games in the future, let us know in the comments below. As always, just want to give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters, and an extra special shout out to our top patrons, Derek Drost, Jesse Spencer, Jump Rock, and Sayano. All of your support and generosity is very much appreciated. Our amazing patrons did actually vote on Wild Arms for this video, so if you also want to vote on the games we cover in the future, maybe consider joining our Patreon. No pressure at all though, as we're happy just to have you here tuning in. Thanks for watching everyone, and hope you have an awesome day. This is Corbin from Gaming Productions. Until next time.